Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Minnesota House of Representatives Transportation Finance and Policy Committee for this February 22nd, 2022. Uh, my name is Frank Hornstein. I'm the chair, and we will start by taking the roll of members. Mr. Dodge. Chair Hornstein. Present. Hornstein, present. Vice Chair Cagle. Present. Cagle, present. Representative Petersburg. Petersburg, present. Petersburg, present. Representative Barr. Here. Bar present. Representative Bernardi. Representative Bernardi. Present. Bernardi present. Representative Elkins. Elkins present. Elkins present. Representative Frederick. Present. Frederick present. Representative Houseman. Present. Houseman present. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich present. Heinrich present. Representative Kosnick. Kosnick present. Kosnick present. Representative Mason. Representative Mason just joined the Zoom call. Representative Mason. Mason present. Mason present. Representative Murphy. Murphy present. Murphy present. Representative Nelson. Nelson present. Nelson present. Representative Olson. Present. Olson present. Representative Richardson. Present. Richardson present. Representative Torkelson. Torkelson present. Torkelson present. Representative West. Representative West. West present. West present. There is a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Dodge. Our next item of business is approval of the minutes uh, from our last meeting, which was on February 17th. Uh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And the minutes were uh, done as well as usual. And so I approve those. I will move to approve those minutes. All right, members, thank you. There is a motion to approve the minutes from Representative Petersburg. Is there discussion? Seeing none, uh, we can do this as a voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails. The minutes are approved. Uh, so members on this snowy Tuesday, we have four bills to uh, consider. And um, uh, our first bill, and so the, the process here will be, um, you know, roll calls automatically on, on all of them, uh, even if we find them not controversial. Um, so our first bill on the agenda is House File 2993 uh, from um, uh, Representative Baker, and I will move that House File 2993 uh, be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And Representative Baker, it's always great to see you. I know you have a lot of transportation interests. I've always enjoyed uh, the several times I've gone out to your area on transportation related uh, uh, business. And uh, welcome to the committee and uh, proceed with uh, your uh, bill uh, introduction and testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, again, uh, a quick update, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you know, Highway 23 is being worked on, the trees are getting removed, we're getting those gaps taken care of. And, and again, with all of our work in the past, uh, it's nice to see that finally coming to fruition. So. Uh, members, I am uh, really honored today to uh, be with a couple of very good friends that uh, came to my wife and I uh, with similar circumstances when, when most of you know that I lost a son, Dan, a couple, uh, about 10 years ago now. Um, and uh, Brian and Kristen Schlegel lost a beautiful boy um, similar to ours, but also uh, in a probably more tragic way that's dealing with what's called this fentanyl issue that we've talked about too. Uh, I'm honored today to present House File 2993 in honor of their son, and I have uh, with me at my home with my wife and I, um, the parents, and uh, Kristen will be speaking on behalf of this, Mr. Chair, so I'd like to uh, uh, bring her in for her testimony, if I may. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Representative Baker and um, Ms. Schlegel. Um, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Kristen Schlegel from Candio High County. Good afternoon, members. Thank you, Chair Hornstein and members of the committee. It's an honor to be here to talk about John. John was 24 when we found him on the morning of November 4th, 2017, cold in his bed. It was our worst nightmare realized. 
He had accidentally overdosed from fentanyl. It snowed the day before we found him, shutting down the harvest that he was helping with on the family farm. He told his dad to drive carefully on the way home. He and I made a Hello Fresh meal for dinner that night, and then we all watched Gold Rush together on the couch. We went to bed first, and he carried our new puppy in so she could say goodnight, and then he told us that he loved us. That was the last time we saw him alive. He died in the night, just feet from our room with the puppy by his side. <sighs> Sorry. From the time John could walk, he wanted to serve his country. He played with his army guys, lining them up just so on the living room floor, watching hours of the History Channel and dreaming of achieving his goal. He joined the army in 2013. He went to boot camp at Fort Benning, Georgia and was stationed at Fort Wainwright in Fairbanks, Alaska. John's MOS was infantry. He was assigned to a striker team where he quickly excelled and became the vehicle commander, even though it was above his rank. John loved the military, his brothers in arms, and wanted very much to be deployed overseas. Unfortunately, John Ryan was injured in an army hockey game, and that dream would never be realized. John served his last year of duty in chronic pain after sustaining a terrible groin injury. He was honorably discharged, even bringing home an award for mer meritorious achievement but he also brought home an addiction to opioids. We found out after he died while going through his medical records that he was given several opioid prescriptions during the last year of his service. John was let down by the army in several ways concerning, concerning the injury. And later he became very disappointed when it took a year to get into the VA, but he never gave up his love for the military. He only wanted to be treated at the VA and he only wanted to be treated by people who had served. He was prepared to go back into the military if we could get him back in good health. A complicated surgery at the University of Minnesota helped tremendously with his pain, but the addiction raged. We didn't know anything about opioid addiction then. We sure do now. We've been very open and transparent about John's struggle, sharing whenever we can and trying to educate people on the dangers of opioids and the fentanyl that killed our son. After his death, we worked side by side with the district attorney to bring the man who sold the drugs to justice and hopefully to save his life. We expected John to take over the farm one day when he had given his time to his military dream. He was our only son and our dream of continuing the family farm ended with him. I can't begin to describe the heartbreak of losing a child. I know Representative Baker shares that knowledge with us, and I hope and pray that the rest of you do not, for it is the worst possible pain and devastation imaginable. We hope to honor John's life by continuing to fight this war against opioids, and our wish would be that every time someone drives down Highway 71 and sees John's name, that they will remember his kind heart and how he cared about others. We hope they remember how funny he was, his smile, and most of all, to remember what happened to him and to be safe. Many of John, John's army buddies came to the funeral from all over the country, and several more wrote to us, telling us story after story of how John singled them out, drew them in, listened to them, helped them, and let them know that they weren't alone. We're proud of him. We hope that you will consider honoring him in this way so his legacy lives on. Again, thank you, Mr. Chair, and we hope that you will support HF 2993, remembering our beautiful boy. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Schlegel, for uh, this just very, very moving and powerful and loving uh, story. And, um, and you have a real partner in your state representative. Who, yes, um, he's been amazing. You know, has, has, been a real champion on this issue yeah. for many, many years. Yeah. And so I appreciate him. I appreciate you and your husband and, and what Thank you're you. bringing to us. And we hope that passage of this bill will, uh, as you said, remind people of his beautiful life. Um, members, I wanted to um, see if there were any questions or, or comments or statements. Um, uh, we'll start with Representative Mason and then Representative Cagle. Representative Mason. Thank you, Chair. 
and to the testifiers. I can't begin to express <laughs> my sympathy for you. I mean, that's, that's and I have three children, so I mean, I, I just know how difficult it is. And my question is, into the bill, I have, I will definitely support the bill and uh, what you're trying to do here. My question is, was your son getting the help that he needed with with the medication as things were going along? And it, and you did mention it took a year to get into the VA. He was not. He was not getting help. Um, we tried everything we could think of. Um, like I said, it, it did take a year to get him into the VA. They um, saw that he had been prescribed depression medication and said just to continue with that and they'd see him back in a year. Um, we had a lot of, you know, at, at the time, the VA was so busy that they had to, um, I, I can't think of the word, but right now, but he had to go to appointments all over the state. You know, the, the psyche valve was in Edina, the, the physical was in Marshall. It took forever. And, um, and then the post office returned his packet because it didn't have our PO box listed in our town of 200. Um, there was a trainer there that day who wouldn't allow it. And then they dis disallowed him. We had to start over again because he didn't respond. Um, they lost a packet altogether. It was lost in our post office for a year. It, it just was a very long road for John. And um, we, uh, we didn't know about Suboxone and some of the other things that we do now that possibly could have helped him then. But no, he didn't get the help that he needed. Okay. Uh, thank Again, you. thank you for your response. Mm -hmm. And you. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Mason. Representative Cagle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and, uh, you know, this isn't really the committee that we tend to air some of this stuff in, but, um, you know, I've gone through that battle with a family member as well. And I don't know why um, my brother survived and recovered and thrived um, and why your son didn't. And um, every time I hear a story like that, I just thank God every day that my brother is still with us and continuing in his journey of recovery. And not only that, but he's helping other people in their recovery. Mm -hmm. So it makes me that's super wonderful. proud. <laughs> Maybe that's yeah. why he survived was to help yeah. all those other people. Well, and then, you know, just thinking about how many years ago I sat in the um, emergency room with him, you know, not, not knowing if he was going to live or die. Yeah. Um, and so um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I serve with Representative Baker on the um, Opioid Epidemic Response Advisory Council and joke with him that we're becoming a power couple here. <laughs> um, but I just really wanted to thank you and, um, you know, I hope that more families end up with stories like mine. So. I do too. Thank you. Okay, let's see members. Uh, oh, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and again, I, I want to also share uh, my sympathies and condolences for your son's loss. Uh, I have a son-in-law that's also uh, has been in the military and is trying to get a disability from an injury. And, and there is a lot of runaround. And, and I wish that that's something that the state had more control over rather than the federal government because it does seem like it's it, it's something that needs to be addressed and so um, and thank you for sharing your story and thank you for uh, your strength and um, and my blessings to you in the future thank you thank you thank you okay members uh, don't see any other hands up and uh, before I give the last word to represent Baker. Um, again, um, Ms. Schlegel, I, I, I know it's so difficult to share these stories and you did it with such grace and, and such dignity and you are an amazing mother and spokesperson for this cause. Um, and I think I speak on behalf of the entire committee and expressing our heartfelt and deep condolences and appreciate your courage and sharing your story. And I hope that the Memorial Highway will um, honor 
deservedly honor your son. Um, Representative Baker, do you have any final comments before we vote? Um, again, Mr. Chair, Madam Members, I just, and, I, and again, uh, this was a picture of John. Um, I never had the opportunity to meet John, but what a good looking young man he was. And, and again, I'm very, very proud of, of what Kristen and Brian brought today to our home. And again, uh, thank you for allowing us the time today to spend um, talking about an issue that you're right, uh, Representative Cagle, we don't get a chance to talk about this much in other committees outside of our stuff that we do. Uh, and we just appreciate your support in this, Mr. Chairman and members, and and uh, look forward to remembering uh, John, Ryan, and others that are in that situation in different ways that we all do. So with that, Mr. Chairman, again, I just uh, appreciate your support moving forward. Okay, thank you, members. Um, I'm going to renew uh, my motion that uh, House File 2993 be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Um, Mr. Dodd, please take the roll on the bill. Chair Hornstein. Aye. Hornstein, aye. Vice Chair Cagle? Aye. Cagle, aye. Representative Petersburg? Petersburg, aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Barr? No. Barr, nay. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Elkins? Elkins, aye. Elkins, aye. Representative Frederick? Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Houseman? Aye. Houseman, aye. Representative Heinrich? Heinrich, aye. Heinrich, aye. Representative Kosnick? Kosnick, aye. Kosnick, aye. Representative Mason? Mason, aye. Mason, aye. Representative Murphy? Murphy, aye. Murphy, aye. Representative Nelson? Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Olson? Olson, aye. Olson, aye. Representative Richardson? Richardson, aye. Richardson, aye. Representative Torkelson? Torkelson, aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative West? West, aye. West, aye. There are 16 ayes and one nay. Thank you very much. The uh, bill will move on now to Ways and Means. Uh, appreciate uh, your um, work on this, Representative Baker, and I think we're going to see you again soon. Uh, with some of your other legislation in this committee. Yes, sir. Thank so, you. Thank you, Representative Baker. Um, so with that, members, we're going to move on now to um, House File 2966 from Representative Kosnick. And uh, we are um, kind of continuing on with our theme of honoring those uh, who have given their service to our country. Um, Representative Kosnick, uh, you're welcome to your committee. Uh, uh, at least the uh, testifiers, virtual testifiers desk. And uh, I believe you have a motion for this um, bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, calling in my committee is a little uh, assumptuous, but uh, I like the sound of it nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> You're a member of, but you know, everyone on this committee should consider it their committee. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Chair, I would uh, move uh, actually, I'm not sure where we're moving this file to. Um, uh, it's actually, I think you have an amendment, but we, but whether, whether the amendment goes <laughs> on or off, I think it goes to the Veterans Committee. I don't know the right. formal name of it. What, uh, Mr. Uh, Howe, what is the formal name of that committee? Uh, Mr. Chair, it's the Labor, Industry, Veterans, and Military Affairs, Finance, and Policy Committee. Okay. That's where your bill is going, Representative Cosmic. That's the motion. Uh, Rather than trying to remember that, that is my motion. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was veterans and labor and some other stuff. <laughs> yeah. You proceed with your testimony. Do you have an amendment, uh, Representative Cosman? Uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to move the H2966A1 amendment. Uh, it is an amendment uh, to put the bill in similar, similar language to the Senate companion. Okay, members, um, do you want to maybe just briefly explain. Well, actually, if it's similar to the Senate Companion, you'll explain it So, uh, once we adopt the amendment. So um, is there any discussion to uh, the author's amendment? We can take a voice vote on this, members. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All of those opposed, the motion prevails, and the bill, uh, House File uh, 20. Uh, 966 as amended is before us, Representative Cosme. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Under current law, former service members must have at least 181 
consecutive days on active duty orders to be able to obtain a veteran's designation on state issued licenses or identification cards. House file 2966 modifies eligibility and document requirements for this well-earned designation and distinction of veteran on the license or ID. It allows National Guard or Armed Force, Forces Reserves to obtain the des designation if they have met the reserve requirement, which includes 20 years of qualified service and still requires an honorable discharge or general discharge under honorable conditions. I'm proud to say that this bill request came to me not from a paid lobbyist or an organization, but from a newer Lakeville resident uh, who contacted me this summer and who uh, we will hear from shortly. Uh, Major Vicki Schwartz served our country for over 26 years in the US Army Reserves, but does not have uh, discharge papers that meet the current requirements of 181 consecutive days of active duty. I believe she has 119 days, but as I said, she's served for over 26 years. For Major Schwartz and several Minnesotan veterans like her, there is no doubt that they have served our country with honor. And we should be privileged to provide a small recognition of adding the veterans designation on the license or ID or the plates if they request. So thank you for your consideration of this bill to honor more of our National Guard and Reserve members uh, with this veterans designation. And Mr. Chair, uh, Major Vicki Schwartz is available for a short testimony of why this is important and also to answer some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kosnick. Let's proceed with the testimony. Uh, Major Schwartz, uh, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hey, name is Vicki Schwartz. Good afternoon. Mr. Chair and committee members, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. As previously stated, I am a retired major from the United States Army Reserves. I served 26 and a half years from June 1974 through January 2001 exclusively in the Army Reserves. When I relocated to Lakeville, I felt it was time to update my license and to get the veteran designation that so many of my friends had gotten. I was disappointed to discover that the state of Minnesota narrowly defined what a veteran was. Simply, you had to have DD 214 with 181 days of consecutive active duty. It did not matter that I had a United States Department of Defense military ID that allows me to get into any active duty base in the United States. I had a VA veterans identification card. I had Department of Army retirement orders. I had a DD-214 with 119 consecutive days of active duty. I had my ARPC form 249-2-E which is a chronological statement of retirement points. And I had a letter from the Dakota County VA office stating I was entitled to veteran status per federal rules. I also have the following veteran benefits available to me. I earn a monthly retirement stipend. I have TRICARE for life, which is medical coverage. I will be able to be buried at Ward Stanley National Cemetery. I have post-exchange or PX privileges. 
I have for our welfare and recreation privileges that allow me to use um, military resorts around the world. After serving all those years to include being a company commander and a team leader for a training battalion, I found myself unable to get that destination on my card. After a considerable amount of phone calls and help from Representative Kosnick, I was able to get the female veterans license plate with these documents. Yet the licensing agency did not have the flexibility in order to issue me that simple card. So I'm guessing many of you may be wondering why I would go through so much effort for something that perhaps seems insignificant. But from my perspective, I'm a proud American, a proud Minnesotan, and a proud veteran. My family, friends, and I sacrificed a lot during those 26 and a half years in order to serve my country the way they needed me. So today I'm here to respectfully request that the veteran definition and documentation be amended to make it possible so veterans such as myself are able to get the designation on license cards and license plates that we have earned. Thank you. Thank you so much, Major Schwartz. Thank you for your service to our country and to our state and, uh, and for sharing your story. It's very compelling. And I know that there's many more out there that uh, have the same concerns and frustrations you do. So you're a very good spokesperson for the, those that would like to see this bill passed. Um, members, are there any uh, questions or comments? I see Representative Heinrich uh, <laughs> proceed with your question. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, thank you, Major Schwartz for your uh, testimony in our committee today. And um, I just thank you for your service. Um, I was kind of in the, in the same place uh, for a time I ended up um, doing a longer term on active duty in uh, Iraq deployments in uh, 2003 and 2004. But prior to that, I had been um, activated and, and attached to a group of Marines that went to Honduras. And in our total active duty time, uh, I had signed up in the reserves originally, our total active duty time came up to about 150 days. And so I remember um, there being that standard of 181 days and, and kind of being frustrated about that. So um, you know, our military um, service members um, join our, it's, it's a fortunate thing that we're able to kind of join in different ways. A lot of us have had, um, you know, commitments back home and in uh, jobs and businesses to run, but we still want to um, serve in the military and then uh, rise to the call when, when we're called upon um, to go active. Uh, but they are no lesser important than people that uh, spend four straight years on active duty or anybody over that 181 days. So um, thank you, Major Schwartz, for your, um, your testimony today. Thank you so much for your service. Um, we appreciate you. And thank you, Representative Kosnick, for uh, bringing this uh, great bill forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for your comments, Representative Heinrich, uh, and your service. Um, I don't see any additional hands, so I will give the last word to Representative Kosnick. Thank you again, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, Major Schwartz, uh, thank you for bringing this bill to my attention. It's my honor to uh, advance it and, and hopefully get it through passage for us. Uh, it's got good, I already had a hearing in the Senate uh, and it's bipartisan uh, supported here in both bodies. Um, and so members, I renew my motion to send this to the Labor, Military and Veterans Committee 
or the if I missed up their title, uh, the previous uh, motion. Thank you, Representative Koznick. Um, we really appreciate you bringing this forward. And again, uh, Major Schwartz, thank you for being here and for your testimony and your service. Members, we'll proceed to a vote uh, on the motion as amended. Uh, that is, uh, we're voting on House File 2966 as amended. Mr. Dodge, please take the roll. Chair Hornstein. Uh, Hornstein votes aye. Hornstein, aye. Vice Chair Cagle. Aye. Cagle, aye. Representative Petersburg. Petersburg, aye. Petersburg, aye. Representative Barr. Aye. Barr, aye. Representative Bernardi. Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Elkins. Elkins, aye. Elkins, aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Frederick, aye. Representative Houseman. Aye. Houseman, aye. Representative Heinrich. Heinrich, aye. Heinrich, aye. Representative Kosnick. Kosnick votes aye. Kosnick, aye. Representative Mason. Mason, aye. Mason, aye. Representative Murphy. Murphy, aye. Murphy, aye. Representative Nelson. Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Olson. Olson, aye. Olson, aye. Representative Richardson. Aye. Richardson, aye. Representative Torkelson. Torkelson, aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative West. West, aye. West, aye. There are 17 ayes and zero nays. Okay, well, congratulations, Representative Kosnick. Your bill is on the way to the next committee. And um, we're now going to um, proceed to House File 3219, Vice Chair Cagle's bill. Uh, and members, this is uh, a transportation policy bill uh, brought to us by MnDOT. And uh, Representative Cagle, I know that you have some testifiers and uh, this bill um, and an amendment. Um, we're going to be laying this bill over members uh, for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. So, um, Representative Cagle, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And this is a MnDOT technical bill. Um, would you like me to move the amendment? Yes, please. And uh, if there's any anything in the amendment that you think would be uh, important for us to know about, you can very, very briefly mention that. Um, so thank you. The A22, I believe, is the amendment, and it just gets the bill in the language um, that MnDOT would like it. Good. I don't. In the shape. That sounds good. Um, is there any discussion to the uh, A22 amendment members? I don't see any. So uh, we will just do a voice vote to get the bill in the shape the author would like us to consider it. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. All of those opposed, the motion carries. Uh, to your bill, Representative Cagle, to your bill is amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is the MnDOT technical bill. Um, it has to do with um, the North Star bikeway. And I know that there's been some advocates who uh, wanted some input on that. And so uh, we're gonna work with them on some language around the bikeway stuff um, so that we, when we, when it comes back to the omnibus bill, um, we will have some, hopefully, you know, we'll be working on that. There's also some turn backs in there, um, Indian employment preferences, municipal screening boards, um, definitions of drones and insurance requirements, some grant agreement requirements, um, EV charging infrastructure at rest areas and some adjustments to the corridor of commerce. Um, so with that, I will um, leave it to my testifier. Um, Eric Rodin from MnDOT is here to answer some questions along with some other folks on the call. We have um, Tim Mitchell, Ryan, sorry, bro. Mark, uh, so if, yeah, if there's any questions, I'm seeing these names and can't pronounce them. <laughs> so if there's any questions, um, we can turn to the testifiers. That's okay, Vice Chair Cagle. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we have plenty of expertise uh, that you have assembled a good team, but uh, did you want uh, Mr. Rudine to uh, proceed here? Okay, uh, Mr. Rudine, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs, and I can just walk through the sections of the bill very briefly, and then, uh, as Vice Chair Cagle indicated, B-22 
We do have several folks on who can help respond to questions if we need them. So thank you, first of all, uh, Vice Chair, for carrying the bill for us. This is the, the agency technical bill uh, for this session. Um, sec section one of the bill designates the North Star Bikeway, uh, which would run from St. Paul to Canada uh, through the Duluth area. Uh, this uh, is already sort of unofficially designated designated as the North Star Bikeway. We, we work with um, bicycle advocates uh, and that was the name that was uh, selected. Uh, it is also already designated as US Bicycle Route 41. Uh, so it's not really creating a new bikeway. It's just kind of memorializing uh, this name uh, for this particular bikeway. Section two of the bill creates a new legislative route. And uh, this is part of a uh, a situation out on Trunk Highway 67 near Granite Falls, where a portion of that highway has actually collapsed into the Minnesota River Valley. And uh, repairing that, that section of highway really is just not feasible. And uh, so um, we are intending to reroute Trunk Highway 67 uh, and uh, creating this new legislative route 340 would be the, the portion of old 67 uh, that would remain on the trunk highway system. Section three of the bill creates an Indian employment preference for projects on or near uh, a reservation. Uh, this is something that we already do on federally funded projects. And so uh, we would like to uh, offer this preference on projects that are 100% state funded. Uh, the, the preference would be uh, offered to uh, individuals who uh, have a uh, live within a reasonable commuting distance um, of the project location. So that would be negotiated with each uh, individual tribe on each individual project. You might remember this provision has been around for a couple of years and, and we have discussed a, a mileage limitation, which we would be open to uh, if the legislature so desires. Sections four and five of the bill uh, are related to uh, the municipal and county state aid uh, highway systems and would allow uh, cities and counties to collect needs on portions of roadways that are slightly outside of their uh, jurisdictional boundaries. This is not uh, super common, but it does happen from time to time where uh, a county state highway might, for example, go slightly outside of the boundary of a particular county. So this change will allow them to uh, collect money needs on those portions of roadway. Section six of the bill uh, conforms current practice, uh, conforms the law to current practice. And what happened here was that back in 1989, uh, MnDOT had two metro districts, an east metro district and a west metro district. And in that year, those were combined into one metro district. Um, and so previously, the, the metro area had two uh, members on this municipal state aid screening board. Uh, and that's how the, the screening board has continued operating over the years. But we discovered that uh, the statute really refers to one representative uh, from the metro district. So this just uh, clarifies that we should have two city engineers on the screening board. Uh, section seven and eight uh, relate to uh, drone registration and insurance. You might remember we, we uh, did significant work on this issue uh, last year and um, our, our folks as they were implementing those changes uh, discovered a couple of um, provisions that were perhaps not as clear as they should have been. And so uh, the, the changes last year related to uh, an exemption for recreational drones, as well as the ability to provide uh, more flexible insurance options in the drone industry. So uh, those changes are just updating uh, some of the changes we made last year. Uh, section nine and 10, uh, nine is again related to the Trunk Highway 67 uh, situation that I was describing earlier uh, uh, to repeal legislative route 274. Uh, Legislative Route 301 in Section 10 would be repealed, and that road would be turned over to the City of St. Cloud. This is near uh, the uh, state prison in St. Cloud. And then Section 11 repeals a section of, of Minnesota rules that, uh, that requires monthly reporting on transit grants. And for some of the larger uh, transit systems in greater Minnesota, uh, these monthly reports are uh, an administrative burden. 
And so um, we would negotiate uh, or, or arrange with each transit system uh, as to what the reporting schedule should be for grants that they receive uh, for the, the transit program. So uh, reporting will still be required, just not, uh, not in each case on a monthly basis uh, if we eliminate uh, this requirement. Uh, so that's a brief description, Mr. Chair, of the bill, uh, and we would be happy to, to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Rudin. I appreciate your summary. Um, I'm going to just see if we have any hands up. Representative Petersburg, I see you have a question or comment. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and uh, so I kind of missed it here. Where is where's this bill going from here, Mr. Chair? Um, we're going to lay this over uh, for possible inclusion in an omnibus transportation bill. Okay. Well, it, it, it doesn't have an awful lot of, uh, uh, it doesn't have any dollars or anything, so I suppose it could go to the floor. So I was just curious about that. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. The question for Mr. Rudine is, I know that uh, the Indian employment preference has been around for a little while and it has been kind of controversial in the past. Could you kind of clarify again exactly how we resolved some of those issues that we were concerned about in the past? Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Mr. Rudine. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg. I think in the past, um, there has been some concern expressed about um, how, how great of a distance the preference would apply to and, you know, concern that, you know, we, we wouldn't necessarily want to uh, give a preference to somebody who uh, lives in Winona, but is doing a project on the Red Lake Reservation, for example, and that is certainly not the intent. So the, the bill currently refers to a reasonable commuting distance uh, I think last year we had some conversation about, uh, you know, putting something in the law that would uh, maybe restrict that to a 60 mile um, uh, distance, and and if if that is something that is desired, uh, we could we could add that uh, to the language uh, once again to to set a kind of a maximum uh, distance limitation for for when the preference might be applied. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, follow-up, Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you. In, in regards to the current language, as it is that it's a uh, reasonable distance, uh, who makes that determination, uh, Mr. Rudine? Mr. Rudine. Mr. Chair and Representative Petersburg, that would be decided uh, between the department and the tribe. Uh, so really each project would, would um, we would negotiate that with, with the tribe and uh, the reason for that is that, you know, in, in um, the Twin Cities area, for example, you know, a 20 mile distance might be reasonable, but in greater Minnesota, you know, um, somebody may not really think too much of, of driving 100 miles uh, to work on a particular project. And so um, it can really vary project to project and location to location. Um, I would add to that this really uh, mirrors the federal provision, which does not have a specific mileage limitation, but again, sets us up to, to determine that on a case-by-case -case basis. Representative Peters, thank you, Mr. Rudine. Mr. Representative Peters, do you have any further questions? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think uh, that reasonableness uh, gives a little bit more discretion, kind of makes it a little bit more common sense, shall I say. So uh, thank you for that clarification. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Thank you. Good. Appreciate the discussion. Um, are there any further questions or comments? I don't see any. So uh, Vice Chair Cagle, any final thoughts about House File 3219? Um, Mr. Chair, um, nope. Just wanna thank you for hearing the bill and um, renew my motion that House File 3219 be laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. And uh, the bill's laid over, members. And um, we have one final bill today, uh, and that is House File 3220 from Representative Lippert. And um, this bill will also be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus transportation bill. And Representative Lippert, welcome to the Transportation Committee. And uh, Look forward to hearing about uh, House File 3220. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good afternoon, members of the committee. So an electric vehicle in, uh, transition is underway, and to support that transition, we need electric vehicle charging infrastructure. In particular, we need electric vehicle charging infrastructure at regular, dependable intervals across the state. 
electric vehicle owners and those who are considering purchasing electric vehicles need to know that charging will be available as they drive across the state. And placing electric vehicle charging infrastructure at interstate rest stops is a simple way to provide this assurance of access to charging at dependable intervals to the public. This bill creates a simple policy change. It allows for installation and fee collection for electric vehicle charging stations at interstate rest areas. And uh, Eric Dean from MnDOT is here and can comment on this bill as well. Thank you, Representative Lippert. Uh, Mr. Dean, welcome back. And uh, sure. proceed. Thank you. Uh, once again, for the record, I'm Eric Rudine with MnDOT Government Affairs. And uh, Thank you also Representative Lippert for, for uh, carrying this bill uh, for us. This is an agency initiative, uh, as Representative Lippert said, to uh, facilitate uh, the possible uh, installation of uh, electric vehicle charging stations at rest areas. Uh, Mr. Chair, we know that um, electric vehicles uh, do emit far fewer uh, emissions uh, than uh, a traditional um, internal combustion engine. Uh, and you know that that's even including the um, the emissions that are created uh, from create from uh, generating electricity to to charge the vehicles. Uh, so we estimate about three point seven four metric tons per year are are emitted by a gasoline powered vehicle, whereas uh, an EV vehicle uh, would emit about um, uh, one third of a metric ton per year. Um, so far, far, or I'm sorry, it's 0.88%. I'm having a little trouble reading my numbers here, but um, so a, a far less uh, of an impact on greenhouse gas emissions. The electric vehicle registration has been uh, increasing significantly. Um, in 2018, we had just under 6,000 electric vehicles registered in Minnesota. Uh, in 2021, that number was over 19,000. And so there's been about a 221% increase since 2018. And so while EVs still make up a, a relatively small portion of the overall vehicle fleet, uh, the number of EVs is in charging or, or is increasing uh, fairly rapidly. There are uh, over 1,200 uh, charging points in Minnesota. Uh, currently, but there are definitely some gaps uh, in the, the network, and so that's what this bill is uh, intended to help us uh, address. Um, and so, uh, you know, especially on some of those uh, corridors in greater Minnesota, uh, there are uh, locations where we see a need for additional charging stations to be located. And so we worked with uh, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency uh, to come up with uh, a plan for um, accelerating electric vehicle adoption in Minnesota uh, with a goal of having 20% of, of light duty vehicles being electric by the year 2030. We're also working with uh, our neighboring states, especially Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin. We've got a, a five state compact uh, focused on electric vehicles and uh, really trying to take a regional approach uh, to providing facilities for EVs. Uh, the federal government uh, in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act is, is going to be providing funds to states uh, for EV charging stations. And uh, currently, uh, the interstate system in Minnesota uh, has some uh, alternative fuel corridors established already. Others are pending, uh, but we have seen the, the federal guidance, which really has just been released in the last couple of weeks, um, continue to emphasize interstate corridors. So interstate 94, interstate 35, portions of these have already been designated as alternative fuel corridors. Uh, the remaining portions of I-35 and I-94 are, are pending that are not already designated. And uh, we uh, anticipate that Interstate 90 in Southern Minnesota uh, would be added as an alternative fuel corridor um, in the coming months. And so um, the, the guidance that came out on February 10th um, uh, requires states to come up with a plan for spending these federal funds. We, we have to uh, have this plan completed by August of this year. Uh, and again, uh, 
interstate corridors are really emphasized as sort of the first location uh, for creating this EV charging network. And so uh, that's why uh, we've got the bill before you today. Uh, I understand that there have been some concerns expressed about, um, um, about locating EV charging stations at rest areas. Uh, I would like to just mention that there is currently a federal restriction about um, uh, having EV charging stations at rest areas on the interstate network. And so uh, even if this bill passes, there still would be that federal restriction that uh, Congress may or may not uh, choose to remove. Uh, but of course we have um, rest areas on other uh, trunk highways located around the state. And so it, it uh, very well may make sense to install um, EV charging stations at those rest areas. And uh, again, if, if Congress takes action, then we would be prepared uh, to potentially install charging stations at rest areas on the interstates as well. Finally, I'll just close by saying that um, we would envision these charging stations being owned and operated by the private sector. Uh, MnDOT uh, does not really want to um, be responsible for, for installing or maintaining these charging stations, but rather we think that's a more appropriate private sector activity that uh, we would partner with um, private companies to, uh, to own and operate these uh, charging stations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rudine. Thank you for mentioning that uh, private piece. I've gotten a number of questions about that. So thanks for anticipating that. We do have a question from Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I got two or three. Well, first, uh, first question is for you, Mr. Chair. Are we going to be hearing something on the the entire EV rollout in a separate bill or a separate yeah. hearing sometime yeah. later? <laughs> Representative Barr, you are just uh, uh, you anticipated exactly what I was going to say to, at the end of this, but I'll say it now. Yes, we're, we're going to spend a, a bit more time in, in committee on this. Um, you know, there's also some proposals around electrification of transit vehicles. Uh, you know, there's, we, we want to dig in a little di deeper into sort of how, where, you know, how this works in terms of the the mechanics of what uh, Mr. Rudine was talking about uh, related to the uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So this is not the only time we're going to talk about electrification, but of uh, vehicles, um, both uh, personal vehicles and transit vehicles. But it is an opportunity to ask and to discuss, and we certainly have time for that today. So uh, please feel free to ask any questions of Mr. Rudine or the author. Okay, good. Um, I'm going to stick to the bill first, and then if I could come back for a follow-up or two. Absolutely. Um, the first question is, in the way this was presented, that we were going to be able to charge fees, and I don't see anywhere in the bill where um, people who just says that we, they may install, operate, and maintain safely in safety rest areas, but I don't see anywhere in the bill where it says that uh, the consumer will be paying for the electric the electricity they're using. Is that, did I miss that someplace? I guess that would be uh, Representative Lippert. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Barr. So the uh, bill language says it allows for installation of fee collection for electric vehicle. Um, so that's the policy change in the highlighted at the bottom of the bill text, I believe. Doesn't say fee collection. It says electric vehicle charging stations may be installed, operated, and maintained in step in safety rest areas. I'm missing the fee part. Or am I missing? Is there uh, an amendment I didn't see? Uh, either um, Representative Lippert or Mr. Rudine. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Chair, I can I can try to address that. So the the, the section of law that that we're amending here is a restriction on. Uh, commercial activities on the highway right of way. And so uh, th that's really the restriction that we're trying to address is that, um, you know, I think if, if uh, we installed a, a charging station currently and did not charge people a fee to use them, we, we would not actually be prohibited from doing that. But the whole um, concept of a commercial activity where we would be charging fees is, is the situation that we're trying to address. And so uh, while the, the new language doesn't refer to necessarily charging a fee, that, that would be the intention. And that's the restriction that we're trying to 
um, to remove today that so that we would be allowed to um, to charge a fee for the use of these stations. Representative Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I get that we're removing the restriction, but it doesn't say that if there will be a fee charged if they are installed. And uh, I would like to see that some language around the fee stuff uh, added before this hits the floor um, or gets included in an omnibus bill. Um, I'd also like to make some comments that uh, Mr. Rudine, you alluded to this uh, at the end of your comments about um, you don't envision the state actually, you don't, the state doesn't want to actually uh, run and operate an electric vehicle charging network. And what I'm seeing and some of your previous comments in your uh, today were the federal government requires this, federal government requires that. And it's, it looks to me like the federal government is trying to push the state of Minnesota into owning and operating a uh, commercial vehicle, char well, not a commercial, a state owned uh, electric vehicle charging network. And I was wondering if you could address that, how some of the federal interaction around commercial vehicle charging requirements currently, I mean, you said they just came out a couple weeks ago, so I'm not gonna uh, expect you to have everything memorized in there or anything like that, but could you address some of the, how are, with the, the rules from the federal government, how is the state going to be implementing a commercial or privately owned electric vehicle charging network as opposed to a, a state owned network? Mr. Dean. Uh, Mr. Chair, that, um, and Representative Barr kind of got to this a little bit, but uh, the, the, my understanding of the federal funds is that it, it's really for states to work with uh, private industry to, you know, incentivize, for example, if there's a, a place uh, today where maybe there aren't a lot of electric vehicles registered, and so it might not make sense for the private sector to, to install that station today because they couldn't turn a profit at it. Um, we would be able to access those federal funds to provide some sort of incentive uh, for the private sector to do that. But uh, Mr. Chair, we do have uh, Tim Sexton, our assistant yeah. commissioner on uh, yeah, um, to, to do yeah. a little bit better job responding to that. Thank you for mentioning that. And I was remiss members. Um, we do have a testifier from the public that wanted to testify for this to this bill. So um, maybe we could have, if uh, Mr. Sexton has any brief comments, we can take him now. And then uh, we also have Anna Johnson on the line who has prepared testimony. So if we could just do that now, and then if you have an, any additional follow-up, uh, Representative Barr, we'll get back to you. Uh, so Mr. Sexton, and then we'll have Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. For the record, my name is Tim Sexton, and I serve as an assistant commissioner with the uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation. And to Representative Barr, your question regarding the private sector and the federal dollars, um, I think this is very important. Um, and in looking at the guidance, you're right, we're still sort of dissecting it and trying to make sure we understand all the details and nuance. But what is very clear <coughs> in the guidance is that um, these funds are really targeting uh, private sector investment. And as Mr. Rudine mentioned, the idea is that this initial influx of federal dollars will support the private sector to build out this network. Um, and it's important right now because in many place locations throughout Minnesota, it's important to have those chargers in order for people to conveniently travel um, with electric vehicles, but there's not enough EVs out there to incent the private sector to do this on their own. So the intention with these federal dollars is that short term, um, you know, support for the private sector to invest in EV chargers. And I just want to reiterate the fact that um, we at MnDOT are not viewing this as um, something that we want to get involved in, owning and operating these stations. Um, we don't have the expertise or the capacity to service these or to do the installation or negotiate the contract with, with utilities. Um, where it does relate to Representative Lippert's uh, proposed bill is that um, there may be some locations along in rest areas where even with this incentive provided by the federal government, there may still be gaps in the network. And so, um, you know, what this language would allow us to do is give us a little flexibility only in those cases where we can't find a private sector 
site host. So whether this is a, a gas station, a convenience store, a big box store, um, but you still need that, that network, um, you know, would allow us some flexibility to install these stations uh, at rest areas in those situations. Thank you. Um, Representative Barr, if you have one final question or a closing comment, uh, this would be a, sure. your opportunity here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would, I guess just a, a comment at the end was, um, I'm pretty sure that all of our electric providers in the state should be rolled into this conversation. They're the ones that are actually gonna have to be laying electric lines for this and demand and whether their, their capacity it can handle all this, so they need to be definitely involved in this conversation as well. And uh, I, I would really like to see some language around fees included in this. If you're going to put in an electric vehicle charging station, we should not be giving away the electricity. We should be charging for it. And the last comment is, I would like to. See, this is a this bill already is the prohibition on private uh, commercial entities operating these. Maybe the state could uh, change that as well, or maybe we in this committee could change that as well to allow uh, private entities to install electric vehicle chargers in safety rest areas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Representative Barr. And, and the bill is going to be in our committee. And obviously, uh, I know Representative Lippert well, and he'll be interested in engaging with any member that has thoughts or suggestions. Uh, members, what I know we have several more questions or comments. We will get to those, but uh, before we do, I would like to uh, call on Anna Johnson, who has signed up to testify before the committee. Um, welcome to the committee, Ms. Johnson. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Anna Johnson, and I am testifying on behalf of Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization that has been working to accelerate Minnesota's transition to a clean energy economy for nearly 30 years. Transportation is the leading source of greenhouse gas emissions in Minnesota and the country, and is also a major source of air pollution that harms human health. Electrifying our transpor transportation sector is critical to reaching economy-wide decarbonization by mid-century and will also impact public health by improving air quality. Electric vehicles play a pivotal role in this transition. Fresh Energy supports House File 3220. Represent Representative Lippert's bill will allow for improved access to charging infrastructure for electric vehicles along Minnesota's interstates. This will especially support EV drivers in greater Minnesota where there's currently a higher need for charging infrastructure. Expanding opportunities for EV charging will help give drivers the confidence they need to adopt and utilize this emerging climate-friendly technology for their next trip within or through Minnesota. Thank you for your time and Fresh Energy encourages your support. I'm ha happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Johnson, and thank you for your work and, uh, and your engagement with this issue. So uh, I don't see any, unless there's any specific questions for Ms. Johnson, uh, I see many hands up. Uh, if anyone could just, I don't, I'm assuming nothing specifically for Ms. Johnson. So here is the lineup, just so you guys can uh, find your place here. I'm kind of going in memory of the order. Uh, I believe we have um, Representative Heinrich, and then we're going to go to uh, Representative Petersburg, Representative Torkelson, Mason, and Nelson. So keep your questions short, keep, keep your answers brief to, the, to those testifiers who the questions are directed to. Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Chair Hornstein. I will try to keep it brief. I do have a couple questions, either for, I'm not sure if Mr. Sexton or Mr. Rudin is better uh, suited for him, but uh, my first question is, is there been any thought put into um, the security for uh, the rest stop locations? I know um, currently at rest stops, maybe it's, Maybe it's uh, state patrol um, that kind of patrols those areas. Um, obviously you have people, maintenance staff, people coming in and out to see if there's been any vandalism done. I'm wondering what, what kind of the future looks like. Say there's uh, the EV charging stations at these uh, proposed host sites. What would the security look like? Would the state be looked at, try to have to look after these, uh, these facilities? And if vandalism did happen, um, is there a possibility the state would be on the hook for that? Or, um, or would that also be under the private sector's purview? Um, I know I did like a gas station or something. Obviously there's people there all the time, there's cameras. So maybe a little bit different environment for a host site like that than, um, 
than a rest stop. So that's my first question. I have one more, if, if uh, we can do that, Mr. Let's Chair. Let's first. take that one. We've, we've got time, Representative Heinrich. So um, I don't know if that would be for uh, Assistant Commissioner Sexton or Mr. Rudine. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd be happy to, to take a shot. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, that it's correct that uh, on interstate rest areas, especially it would be state patrol that would uh, prim primarily be, uh, you know, in charge of uh, any security at those locations. Um, you know, they, I don't think they typically provide a lot of patrolling at rest areas, although they may, you know, stop in. I think there are even a couple of rest areas that, that have like a small substation for, for troopers to use if they have to fill out paperwork or that sort of thing. Um, we do contract with uh, Greenview, which is the organization that uh, provides uh, custodial um, responsibilities at, at rest areas. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly common to have uh, a, a Greenview staff person, uh, especially at the larger rest areas. Um, and, and, you know, um, certainly during daytime hours to, to have somebody who's, who's actually on site and can sort of help keep an eye on things if necessary. Um, but, you know, I think if, if something did happen, it would probably be the responsibility of the, um, of the private sector company who would, who would uh, be in charge of, of maintaining uh, the, the charging stations themselves. Okay. Uh, Representative Heinrich, well, how about one last one for you? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And thank you for that uh, response, Mr. Rudin. I, I just think it's something that we should um, maybe take a closer look at um, because it, it just seems to me that it, it's not a traditional spot where, you know, you have the private sector in there and then somebody else is responsible for kind of the, the security of that situation. So um, not exactly putting my finger on it right now, uh, but it's something I think we should think about a little bit further. And, and then my other question is um, in regards to, um, it, you know, there doesn't seem to be enough, enough host sites right now. Is there, is there an ask or is there lobby, lobbying from the manufacturers of EVs for um, kind of these state systems? Um, you know, th is the demand um, high enough where, and there's no, there's no private sector like existing gas stations or um, facilities where, where, you know, this, does this make more sense, I guess, to go this route? Um, are they, are they running out of options kind of in, in other traditional spots where uh, motorists get their, their fuel, no matter what form it is? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could refer to Mr. Sexton on this one. I guessed wrong on that. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Sexton. Sure. Thank you, Chair and Representative. Um, that, that's a great question. Um, I think the way that we're viewing this bill language is to provide us with some additional flexibility. Um, our first approach um, working, especially with these federal dollars, will be to identify private sector site hosts. Um, and that the flexibility that this would afford us is, you know, to fill in, potentially fill in some of those gaps where we can't identify uh, private sector hosts. And it's important to note too that we, uh, we really haven't had the opportunity because we didn't have the funding to go along with these, these asks in the past to go out and really uh, work with those potential site hosts to identify charging locations. And so that's what we're really, I guess, excited about with this new bill is that we have you know, a real incentive for people to consider adding, to, for private sector site hosts to add these chargers. So we feel like this is gonna give us some flexibility, but again, it's important to note that at least we're viewing this as a place to fill in gaps where we cannot find private sector hosts. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks for your questions, Representative Heinrich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ne next on the list is Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and I'm going to ask my question kind of in two parts so you don't have to come back to me. But okay. the first question revolves around what I've heard and what I think I didn't hear. And that is, uh, I heard uh, Mr. Radin say that the agency worked with the EPA and, and others to determine the energy policy and how we accomplish our goals. Uh, but then Mr. Sexton made some assumptions that said that the stations that we have along interstates and others aren't enough for private industry or private uh, providers of, of electrical energy to do that. And yet I, I never heard anybody say that they had gone to the actual 
energy providers to ask their input and to ask what, what they had been doing. And so since the infrastructure coming into these uh, stations will have to be provided by the energy companies, uh, my guess is that they would be very willing to talk about it. So I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that you're going to be talking to them. Um, and if you have, uh, please, please let us know that. Uh, the other piece is that I will follow up with is just saying that I agree with uh, Representative Barr. I think this bill has a lot of issues that need to still be worked out. Um, the providing of infrastructure for fees, uh, whether or not we get it from federal government approval or not, I think that's still an issue that needs to be dealt with and how we deal with uh, what companies want to come in all need to be addressed a little bit more specifically than, than what we have in this bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Representative Petersburg. Um, do we have a MnDOT representative that wants to respond to Representative Petersburg? Yeah, thank you, Chair and Representative Petersburg. Um, it's a great question, and I think it's also great to hear that we we feel I feel like we're largely aligned here. Um, so two two parts, and please let me know if I, I don't fully answer the question. But the first one in regards to working with utilities, um, part of the planning process that is required in order to access the federal funds for EV charging does require us to develop a plan that's due by August 1st. Um, and part of that, that, and part of the guidance, it does identify a number of stakeholders that we need to reach out to, and that includes utilities. So in advance of that, though, I will also share that we've, we've had a number of informal conversations with utilities around the state um, to understand what their needs are, because uh, we agree that they're gonna be really important partners here. Um, and partners, I think it's going to vary by utility. Um, some utilities are, own, are installing chargers themselves, and others are supporting the infrastructure. Um, but the other key role that they will play is some of these chargers, especially when we talk about the faster chargers that have more energy needs, um, they're going to require some utility upgrades. And so we need to work with utilities to understand where we can most cost effectively you know, support chargers to be added so that we're not adding or suggesting chargers in locations that are very expensive for the utilities. So we agree 100% that they're very important partners and they will be part of this planning process. And the second piece regarding fees, um, you know, while it's not explicitly required, working with the private sector um, on these, with these federal funds, we fully expect that they will be charging fees. Um, and that's why it's really important to working with the private sector because otherwise they won't be in business if they're not charging fees to cover their expenses. Now, the one final note on this is that the federal dollars do allow for some short-term support for operating and maintenance costs, especially in those locations where the demand for charging might be lower right now. So there is some support that could be provided if, uh, if we elect to go that route. But the fees and the connection to the private sector is really important. And we fully expect that they will be covering their costs plus, plus profit as part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK, any follow up? Representative Petersburg? Yeah, if I could just say, uh, so, so one thing that just to be careful of is trying to make the assumption that government will know which is best located for high speed or infrastructure charging or not, because I will tell you, the industry knows a lot better than, than we do as government. So uh, you should take their lead rather than trying to lead them in that regard. Uh, as just a follow-up statement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, I'm done. Thanks, Representative Petersburg. We have Representative Torkelson followed by Representative Mason. Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, there's lots of potential questions here. I'll try to restrict myself. Uh, it's, is there a vision for how electrical vehicle charging is going to look in the future? Are these installations at Wayside Rest intended to be a permanent fixture or a stopgap until we see them at the local convenience store where uh, while you're waiting for your char car to charge, you can get a pizza and a Coke? Uh, MnDOT response. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Chairman. I'm gonna assume, you know what? I'm going to assume that uh, that's fair. <laughs> Mr. Sexton's going to take the rest of these. Uh, Mr. Sexton. Thank you, Chair and Representative Turkelson. Turkelson. Um, yeah, I think that this is really important. Um, you know, even right now, 
it's fair to say that we we think that the private sector already is the best location for these so private sector site hosts um, and that it's unclear what the long-term outlook is for rest areas or any sort of publicly owned space for EV charging. So I think that the need right now in terms of the short is short-term flexibility to address those gaps, um, you know, and it's likely that those would be a short-term need, um, but it's hard to say um, because this industry is changing so quickly that I think we're looking at this as giving a little bit more flexibility. And again, this bill would allow us to charge a fee um, where we currently are unable to at, at safety rest areas. Thank you. Representative Torkelson. Well, just to comment, Mr. Chair, you know, I, I understand why uh, there's a desire to get some infrastructure out there to make electric vehicles feasible in the short term. I think it'd be a mistake to invest heavily uh, with high speed chargers that require lots of infrastructure at these locations because the private sector isn't going to want them at rest stops, frankly. They're going to want them where they can sell the pizza and the coke. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Sexton, for your answer. Thank you, Representative Torkelson. We have Representative Mason and then Representative Nelson after that. Representative Mason. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and the comment. I remember when we were in Israel in 2009, when we were hearing about the infrastructure that they were putting in then. So at least right now, it's encouraging to me to see that we are making some progress here in Minnesota. And maybe you might wanna add some additional comments on that. Thank you. Uh, was that directed at any uh, anyone? No, only if you wanted to add something about mm. what you remember. Well, I mean, yeah, I've, tra I've traveled uh, in Europe and the Middle East. And, um, you know, all I can say is that, uh, you know, this is a, a global initiative. Um, I was in Glasgow at the uh, climate, uh, UN climate conference in November, and there was a lot of conversation about electric vehicles and electric charging stations. So I guess all I can say, Representative Mason, is that, you know, this is really an international priority. And I think uh, certainly a national priority is uh, evidenced in the investments that were made in the, the federal infrastructure and jobs bill. Um, I should be more accurate. <laughs> infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Uh, so, we, you know, it's all it's been my view that we should do our part here in Minnesota, but you know, members have asked some really good questions today, and and I think there is a lot of food for thought uh, in terms of how we do this, not if we do this, but how we do this. So, thank you for that observation, Representative Mason. Um, I believe our last member question is from uh, Representative Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And uh, getting back to the question of charging a fee, as I read the bill. And I looked at the statute in the time we've been discussing this here, but the bill in line 1.17, right before the, the, the new language being added in the section of, of law that it's being put in, the section of law says no commercial establishment, commercial establishment within the right of way, and then there are exceptions. And there's a list of exceptions, and the one right before this is vending machines may be placed in rest areas. And I had never been at a rest area where they give away candy free. You have to pay to use the vending machine. But I think it's applied that it's if you're going to be doing com allowing commercial business in a, in a um, in the rest area, and this is allowing commercial electric vehicle charging stations in the rest area. You're going to be charging a fee. I think it's implied in, again in the sectional law that it's in. And again, if you're going to do commercial business, you're going to be charging a fee, and you're going to be charging a profit hoping to get a profit, Mr. Chair, thank you. And thank you for your uh, quick uh, work on the, doing some legal research for us, uh, Chairman Nelson. Um, okay, members, um, I don't see any additional hands. Um, so we can um, maybe proceed with wrapping up here, maybe some comments from uh, Mindad and the author, and then we'll lay the bill over and adjourn. So uh, last word to Mindad and the author. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just appreciate the discussion. There have been some uh, really good questions, and you know, this is a kind of a a new newish activity, at least. And so, you know, when when we have new systems like this, um, there there can be some unknowns, clearly. But um, we look forward to working, you know, with you and others. Uh, as we mentioned, we we have to do a lot of work between now and August uh, to kind of come up with the plan uh, for in, for um, locating and installing EV charging stations. So it, it's an exciting time um, in the industry and, and we're going to see lots of changes, I think over the next uh, several years with, with the way uh, we, we um, power our transportation system. So thank you for your, your time today and, and we look forward to working with you as the building is forward. Thank you very much, Mr. Rudin. And then I'll just turn for some final thoughts and observations, comments from Representative Lippert. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I appreciated the time, the conversation today. I think this, this transition is, is critical uh, for our climate and uh, putting infrastructure in place is also key. Exactly how it's done is a part of the conversation. I think the exchange contributed to that uh, effort today, but I look forward to working with members, um, and I appreciate the consideration of the bill today. Thank you, Representative Lippert. I will echo what um, Representative Lippert said. I really, this has been a fantastic and thoughtful discussion today, and it, it'll be one of several we have in committee about various aspects of electrification of transportation infrastructure. We'll touch on it a little bit next week uh, when the Met Council uh, talks uh, about their bus electrification uh, transition plan. Um, we will obviously be talking about it when we get to the, in, you know, uh, larger conversation about the uh, uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. So there'll be many opportunities to continue this conversation, but this was a good way to kick it off. So thank you for bringing this bill forward, Representative Lippert. Um, and so with that, members, I will be, I will lay over House File 3220 for possible inclusion in the omnibus transportation bill. So there will be plenty of time to work on this and work through some of the issues that um, have been raised today. So members that um, concludes our, our bills for today. Um, just a little preview of Thursday. Um, we are going to be hopefully once and for all uh, resolving the longstanding discussion in this committee about salvage titles. Uh, so we'll have, um, we'll be discussing House File 3296 from Representative Joachim. Representative Baker will be back with uh, a bill uh, related to towing and uh, Representative Moeller uh, on also a towing related bill. Um, there was a bill originally on the agenda today from um, uh, Representative Becker Finn related to speed limits and that uh, was not included in our agenda today. Uh, and that's, we, we don't have a date for that bill as of yet, but uh, uh, that bill was dropped from the agenda today. We won't be hearing it in the near future, uh, at least the next couple of weeks. Uh, so that, with that members, we are adjourned and I will see you on Thursday. Have a good uh, rest of the day, safe driving and uh, keep warm. Be well, bye-bye.